And it's my pleasure to present one of uh, our uh, representative of the University of Trento, Professor Paolo Rec. Paolo uh, got his PhD at the University of Padova. He visited uh, the entire world, I think, uh, from Brazil to national labs in the United States. His research uh, focused more on reliability systems. Uh, so Paolo will give a keynote uh, on the intersection between uh, HPC, AI, and reliability. Paolo, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good morning uh, and welcome to Trento. Uh, if you look outside, you see the reason why I came back to Italy after so many years in the United States, because I love mountains, so this is the right place to be here. Um, the presentation I'm going to make today regards reliability, okay? Why do we want to address reliability in a high-performance computing primary school? Uh, because reliability is often viewed as, as a, a trade-off to performances, but it is actually part of performances. It, it, uh, you can be as fast as you want, uh, but if the result that you get is wrong, then you wasted a lot of time. So that, that, that is the whole, uh, the whole reason why we are addressing reliability. Reliability is a nice problem because you can always solve it. You just duplicate or triplicate things uh, and you are done. So it is a problem that is very, very easily to be solved. It is hard to be solved in an efficient way, okay? Uh, so the whole idea, again, is to try to understand where the problems come from and find uh, efficient solutions to that. So the specific problem that we are addressing uh, regards radiation reliability. So those cosmic rays particles that flip bits uh, in, in the memory or change the values uh, of some operations. Um, when you have that problem in the hardware, uh, the application that runs in your system can experience what we call a detected unrecoverable error. I'm pretty sure you are all familiar with those error messages. Uh, when that happens, uh, don't, don't always blame Microsoft or Apple uh, because it's very easy to blame the, the software interface that you have with your hardware. Uh, and let's also admit that the hardware vendors um, are, are very uh, careful in not changing the way that we blame the computer. So we always blame the operating system, never the hardware. But when those things happen, there's a good chance that uh, it was not a software problem, but a hardware problem. Uh, or you can have a silent data corruption. So your application finishes, it provides you with, with an output, uh, but the output is wrong. Okay, so that is the problem that, that, that we need to address, uh, which some of you might have heard of that. The majority probably never heard of that. Uh, but it's actually out in the news, uh, mainly for supercomputers. Uh, reliability is a great issue. So one of the best ways to kill a supercomputer is to expose it to radiation. Uh, and clearly, uh, radiation is a significant problem for any uh, space applications. So that is the problem that we need to address. And this is the technical outline of the talk. Uh, I will start with some reliability essentials. Um, so I, I, I want to try to explain you the very basic of radiation from the physics uh, of the impact uh, of particles till the manifestation of the error at the output of your application. Try not to be boring. Uh, I understand that, that, that you don't like hardware, but actually I like it a lot. Um, uh, so I, I will try to give you some background on, on where radiation comes from uh, and how to have some uh, realistic evaluation of what can happen so that you can design efficient and effective hardening solution. I will give you a list of funny and not so funny stories about radiation effects in history, uh, just to convince you that th this is a real problem, uh, for then addressing how we can address those. So what is the traditional way of addressing with reliability and how we can actually uh, be smarter than that uh, with a specific case on object detection for autonomous vehicles uh, just because that is an application that is very easy to understand uh, and, and to try to find smart ways to uh, impede errors from happening, and then I will conclude. So let's start with the um, uh, reliability problem, and I will start from the beginning. So where radiation come from? So radiation comes from the outer space. Uh, you have those uh, celestial bodies, explosions or collisions that, that um, produce materials, so heavy atoms, uh, that wander around the universe, uh, while wandering around the universe, they lose charge, uh, either an electron or a proton. Uh, so basically they become ions. So they are charged uh, and interacting with the magnetic field of the different planets, they actually get accelerated 
uh, till reaching giga or tele electron volt. Um, these, these are the main problem of radiation in the outer space. Uh, when we consider the Earth, we also have the sun that is a quite efficient emitter of protons and, and electrons. Uh, but the sun is quite uh, close to the Earth, so those particles do not get accelerated a lot, and they are confined in what, in what we call the, the Van Allen belts, which are the, the blue belts there uh, on the Earth, which, which are quite uh, radioactive uh, places. A any application uh, that needs to go to the outer space, they, they, they are switched off uh, passing through the Van Allen belt, uh, and the International Space Station is actually inside the Van Allen belt uh, to prevent problems. Uh, to, the, to the astronauts. And actually, uh, radiation problem in space is quite huge. I mean, I'm not going to the details of all the, the data that you can find here, uh, but just to give you a rough idea, a single trip to Mars will basically kill half of the cell of your body because of radiation. Uh, so when Elon Musk propose you a ticket to Mars, be sure that that is a one-way ticket. You can hardly come back. Um, and um, I mean, passing through the Van Allen belt equal like a hundred and something full scan body of X-rays of your body. Okay, so th those are not very funny places to be. Uh, and one of the reasons why we are not going to the moon again is because now we know that the radiation is a problem. Back then, we didn't know. Uh, and uh, a couple of weeks after Armstrong and, and the crew came back from the moon, there was a huge solar flare so that would have killed uh, all of them uh, and they would have died without knowing why. Uh, so now that we know that those things can happen and we can't actually predict the, this kind of events, we are more cautious in sending people out of the Van Allen belts. Uh, one of the, the, the solar storm happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, and, and you could see that the Northern Lights, uh, even in California. Um, again, we are protected by the magnetic field of the Earth, so most of the particles that come from the sun are confined uh, in what we call the Van Allen belt. Th those are actually a shield for us. So the, the denser the Van Allen belt, the lower the radiation that can reach ground. Uh, however, the galactic cosmic rays that come from the outer space are so energetic that they don't care about the magnetic field of the Earth, uh, and they pass through the Van Allen belt, hit the atmosphere, and generate a cascade of particles that reach ground. As I mentioned, um, it is a common belief that when the sun is a very active, uh, we, 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 we might have problems uh, on Earth in communication or, or errors in electronics. Actually, it is the other way around. So here you have a graph of the solar activity in green. Uh, as you can see, it's very periodic. Uh, and the correspondent neutron flux at sea level. As you can see, uh, when we have a higher solar activity, the neutron flux at Earth is lower. And that is because when activity is high, uh, the Van Allen belts are thicker, so uh, they, they actually act as a, as a shield for us. That is clearly not true for space applications and for satellites. Um, so the galactic cosmic rays are so energetic that pass the Van Allen belt, hit the atmosphere, interact with the upper level of the atmosphere, and generate a cascade of particles that reach ground. Uh, these particles can be muons, protons, pions, gamma rays, but mainly neutrons. And neutrons are the bad guys here. Uh, and uh, on the average, we have 13 neutrons per square centimeter per hour that, that, that reach ground. So that, that is the amount of particles that we need to care of. Uh, what happens when a particle hits a transistor? And I am sorry if I go so down in the details in the hardware, but it, it, it's a summer school, right? So you, you should also see things from different perspectives. So that is a transistor. If uh, anyone doesn't know uh, the, the structure of a transistor. so. A transistor is actually a, an electronic device, and a particle that hits silicon produces electricity and charge. Okay, so that, that is what, what happens. So you have a transistor uh, that, that is switched off. You have the ion track, which deposits a huge amount of charge, uh, modifies the electric field, uh, the electron hole pair are generated, so you have charge generating the silicon that, that are collected in a channel of the transistor, modifies the potential, you have funnel effect, potential deformation, uh, collection of charges, and basically what happens is that you are simulating with a charged particle uh, the turning off of your turning on of your transistor. Uh, so if you want to be more schematic, what happens when the particle hit your transistor is that it deposited a huge amount of charge that is recollected, and basically you form the channel of the transistor in a transistor that is supposed to be switched off. 
uh, th that is what happens and that is where the, the, the problem comes from. So you have a given time in which a transistor that was supposed to be off is actually turned on and the other way around. Now, if that transistor is part of a memory cell, uh, that effect is sufficient to trigger uh, the, the bit flip. So you reverse the bit that is stored in your memory. Uh, if that transistor is part of logic, the, the, the spike can be latched. So basically you have an error in your uh, application. These arrows are called soft arrows because the device, the physical device is not damaged. So you are not burning the transistor. You are simply turning it on or off uh, without any signal. Uh, the fact that these arrows are called soft, it doesn't mean that they are not important. Uh, they are actually the worst kind of arrows ever. Uh, because if you have a memory cell that is burnt, so you, you, it's very easy to detect it because you can just read and write a value. And, and if the result is wrong, you simply forget and never use that memory location again. In this case, since the arrows are transient and soft, uh, you can basically, you cannot trust any memory location or any uh, application output. These arrows again can lead to uh, silent data corruption, which basically means that your application finishes. Uh, everything is fine, there is no flag of errors, but the output can look like that. So you can have a totally uh, screwed up uh, image processing, or you can have a single pixel corrupted when you play in for speed, which basically you, you actually don't care. Uh, or you can have a physical simulation that is completely wrong, or you can have a wrong bank transfer or a wrong classification or detection uh, in, instead of Javin cost. Uh, the situation is actually even worse than, than what I just told you. So this is um, a simulation of the track of an ion hitting silicon. Uh, basically is the spatial uh, distribution of the charge where you have yellow, you have sufficient charge to induce a, a bit flip in, in a transistor. Okay, uh, what I'm trying to show you is that while the, the transistor shrinks, the particles don't. Okay, so uh, the smaller the transistor, the higher the, the probability of having multiple transistors uh, co corrupted by the same particle. Let me zoom that in. Um, this is actually on scale. Uh, so uh, the different CMOS generation from uh, uh, 350 micron till seven nanometers, uh, so when you have the old transistor, transistor is very big, okay? So you have a lot of charge there and the single particle hitting transistor might not be sufficient uh, to, to induce an error. But as you move down uh, in the technology, so you improve the transistor technology, uh, the, the size to start to shrink, uh, basically inducing an error in every particle that you hit the device. And in seven nanometers, the transistor dimension is so tiny compared to the particle track that it might happen that the same particle corrupt more than one transistor. Why that is a problem? Because if the transistor is part of memory, the single particle can corrupt multiple bits that you have stored there. The multiple bits can be uh, part of the same word in your memory that is called a multi-bit upset uh, or uh, spread in different words, uh, a so-called multiple cell upset. Why we need to care of that? Because if you turn on your uh, single error detection, single error correction, double error detection ECC in your GPU or in your uh, CPU, uh, the multiple bit upset will not be corrected uh, because it's a double bit in the same word. You don't know what to do and basically you crash the application. Um, and the computing architecture nowadays are, have some weaknesses. Uh, so this is a GPU, but that this apply to any parallel architecture. Uh, it, it's very high, very big. So it has a lot of things that can go wrong. And you can have like an error in a register or an error in a computing core. Uh, and if that happens, you can expect the single thread uh, using that register or being executed in that logic core to experience an error. But if you have an error in the scheduler or in the shared memory, uh, a bunch of thread will use that, that wrong uh, value. So you can expect to have multiple thread corrupted. Uh, why that is critical? Let me show you that with a very easy example, which is um, object detection. So uh, th that is actually me while hiking the mountains. So uh, if you have a single thread corrupted while you perform a convolution, imagine that as having a single pixel corrupted in your feature map. That is very unlikely to cause any problem. Okay, but if you have 
uh, unnarrowed in a shared resources, uh, you have a bunch of pixels that, that can be wrongly processed, uh, and that can basically lead to uh, wrong uh, detection or misclassifications uh, or, or, or even um, uh, mis mis misclassifications. Uh, that, is, that is clearly uh, a very tolerable error because it happened all the time when I walk around the street, but that can actually happen. And I will give you some ideas on how frequently those errors are. Now, to give you a very a uh, straightforward example of why radiation is a problem. So we all know that we don't like neutrons. I mean, our body actually do not like neutrons a lot, uh, but electronic uh, likes neutrons even less. If you have assisted the, the series Chernobyl, or if you, if you know what happened, uh, you might have noticed that they tried to clean the rooftop uh, of the reactor using a robot uh, that lasted for a few seconds. And then because of neutrons, the electronic died, and that was the end of the experience. Well, humans were, were safe uh, for, for tens of minutes up there, which basically means that, again, we don't like uh, neutrons, electronic likes them even, even less. Now, let's move towards the problem that we need to face now. So the problem is that uh, currently we have in the market a lot of different devices, uh, accelerators, GPUs, Xeon 5, ARM, RISC 5, FPGAs, and a lot of different applications in which we want to adopt this, this the hardware. Uh, consumer electronics, uh, uh, data center, HPC, and then space and, and automotive. Each application has a different reliability requirement. For the consumer, we just want the consumer not to be upset or uh, at worst to, to blame the operating system. That, that is fine uh, for reliability. If we want to be in data center or HPC, we need to be high reliability for not wasting time. I mean, for not running the, 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 the simulation for a week and then throwing away the, the, the week of work because there was errors. And obviously in space and automotive, you need to be uh, very, very high reliability. And we are crossing the domains. So the same, the same GPU that, that you can buy to, to, uh, to, to play Need for Speed or to mine Bitcoins uh, is exactly the same hardware that you use in HPC and that Nvidia wants to put uh, in autonomous vehicle. Okay, the problem is that the same hardware uh, is built for a different domain, and we are pushing to use that on a domain where reliability is more important. So we really cannot work on the hardware because it would be too costly. And if you make an hardware resilient to radiation, it means that it has very poor performances. So we need to find new ways to deal with radiation eventually in software. Uh, there is another problem, the fact that we have this complex architecture that runs complex application. I put a neural network there, but you can put a physical simulation as well. Um, and the error happened in the transistor and that, so let me zoom that out. Uh, the error happened in the silicon and then it propagates to the circuit, to, to the gate level, to the microarchitecture, finally reaching the output of your software. Okay, so the, 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 the propagation of the fault is quite complex. Um, for memory, as we see, is, uh, it's quite naive, so in the sense that we have a uh, particle hitting a transistor and that translates into one or multiple bit corrupted. But when we deal with the computing resource, uh, the, the, the effect of the single particle on the output of your operation can be qu quite, quite complex uh, and not trivial. Okay, so for memories, uh, we know what happens. It's simply uh, one bit or multiple bit corrupted when you're running a code and you have an error in the ALU or in the scheduler, you can have an output error, uh, but that will depend on which, which values you are multipl multiplying, for instance, or you can have uh, you change the, the operation, so you have an error in the opcode and you change the operation that is being performed, or you have an error in the scheduler and you change completely uh, the execution uh, of the code. So it's quite complex to understand what is the effect of faults uh, in, in your application. How we address that in our lab, uh, we actually expose the hardware uh, to accelerated particle beams. Uh, so we really take the, 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 the GPU or the device, expose it to radiation uh, and see how radiation modifies the output. And we do that using um, high energy physics lab like, like ISIS. I mean, th that is not that ISIS, that is ISIS in the UK. Uh, the name was, was obviously written before ISIS is Syria. Uh, it's because the, the river Thames, which passes by in, 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 in Latin, is called Tama ISIS. So that, that is why they call it ISIS. Anyway, ISIS is a, is a, is a false neutron source 
that, that you can see there, there is a synchrotron that accelerates protons, and that protons are directed in the experimental hole, which are the two buildings there. Uh, and then protons hit a, a small nuclear reactor. So it's like playing pool, okay? So the, the protons arise very quickly, hit the neutrons, and you basically accelerate neutrons. Um, uh, if you wanna, I mean, that, that is me in the lab, so just to see the, the dimension, uh, the size uh, of the lab. Um, and what we do again is align different boards with the neutron accelerated beam to see which is the effect of neutrons on the electronics. Here, this is the test we performed at CHIP IR uh, in, in May. Uh, we tested different t tensor processing units, different GPUs, uh, and RISC V. And then we also went to Radev in Finland uh, to test embedded GPUs uh, for space applications. And basically what we do is we expose the boards with the beam. We have a system that detects if there is a, uh, an SDC. So we compare the result, we compare the output to see if there were an error. Uh, we, we detect if, the, if we need to reboot the system to power cycle the system with the whole server uh, and, and then we analyze data. Uh, that, that, that is uh, a very tidy experiment. Actually, this is the situation normally when we go there. So it's quite messy. So, so that was my previous PhD student trying to uh, rewrite the bootloader of, of a GPU that were corrupted because of neutrons. As you can see, uh, our setup is quite messy, uh, but, but it's a funny experience. Um, we use those labs because they provide a neutron beam that resembles the terrestrial one. So, so this is the spectrum of energy of neutrons um, in mass in, in red, the, 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 in the hertz in blue, and then uh, in red, you, in black, you have the the, the ones we use. As you can see, the curves are pretty similar. So basically we, we are uh, testing the device with the same kind of neutrons that you can find in nature. The difference is that to be compared, uh, the atmospheric one were multiplied by 10 to the nine. Uh, so, so in those labs, we have 10 to the nine more neutrons that you have normally. So you can have data ve very quickly. Um, let, let's give me some numbers. So just to convince you that, that th these things are real. So we tested matrix multiplication uh, on a device A, okay? I, I'm not showing you the, 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 the vendor just so I can give you the real numbers. Uh, it was a very highly parallel device used for <laughs> uh, HPC and convolution. Um, so we run matrix multiplication continuously while we were bombarding the, the device. Uh, I need to be careful in not saying which kind of device. And what we do is we measure in those experiments the, what is called the cross section, which is the probability for one neutron to generate an error. So what we do very easily, we count the number of, of errors that we observe, we divide it by the number of neutrons that, that we got in the board. And that is a very simple probability. That is very interesting because if you multiply that cross section, which is the probability for one particle to generate an error, by the flux of neutrons at sea level, we have the expected error rate. Put in the numbers, so that matrix multiplication, that device A, uh, give a cross-section of 2, 10 to the minus 6, uh, multiplied by 13 neutrons per meter per hour, that gives us an error rate of 3.4, 10 to the 4 failure in time. Failure in time is an error every 10 to the 9 hours of operation. So doing the quick math, if you take that device and you run matrix multiplication in your desk, you will eventually see one error every 3.2 years of continuous operation. You might think that that error rate is quite reasonable and, and this talk has a very little meaning, okay? And I agree with you if you take that device to run a need for speed in your laptop. But mind that Titan, for instance, has 18,000 of those device A, okay? Uh, each of that has an error every 3.2 years. So you expect, 18,000 hours every 3.2 years, which basically means 14 hours per day, okay? So the single device error rate might seem low, but if you scale it up, that is the error rate. And if you like to play this game, in Europe, we have 268 million cars. On the average, 4% of those cars are actually driving in the street. If each of those cars have that device A to run convolutions for up detection in self-driving cars, we expect 1.7 to the seven arrows every 3.2 years, which basically means 380 accidents per hour. Uh, currently in Europe, we have 290 accidents per hour caused by human arrows. Okay, so 
that, that is a problem that we need to address. Uh, some, some stories, okay, uh, just to keep up the attention. This is, this is one of the examples that, that I, I observed when I was in, in Los Alamos. Uh, so we were running uh, weather simulations uh, in, in the Los Alamos supercomputer. Um, and after a week of simulations, we observed that cloud over the North Pole, which was actually not a cloud. It happened to be a salt aerosol. And there was more salt in, in that cloud than in the whole universe. So that was clearly an error. And Daniel from NASA Goddard take all the checkpoint and start till he found out where radiation produces that error, which basically uh, was 10 days of lost uh, use of the HPC in Los Alamos. Uh, other funny stories, in 2003 in Virginia Tech, they tried to build a supercomputer out of the uh, Power Mac. Uh, back in the days, Apple were uh, designing its own chip. They were very efficient. Uh, so they tried, well, let's put a thousand of those together and let's build a supercomputer. But Apple did not put any solution for reliability because it was a consumer device. So why should they care about reliability? But it happened that, that, that the big Mac that they built uh, could not even boot uh, be because of errors while booting the operating system. And that was uh, sold in eBay and that was the end of uh, Apple story in supercomputer. Um, Los Alamos actually had a couple of good uh, experiences. Jawad was the top one uh, in the top 500 list. It had 350 ECC errors per minute, uh, and ASCII-Q could not run uh, for more than one hour without crashing. Los Alamos actually uh, is interested in radiation because the, the, the flux of neutrons increases exponentially with altitude. So that is the flux of the particles in violet. You have neutrons uh, as a function of altitude, and mind that the scale is logarithmic, so the increase is exponential, not, uh, not linear. So in Los Alamos, you, you can expect eight to 10 times more errors than in Oak Ridge, for instance. Um, and the peak of neutrons is at 13 kilometers, which is where airplane flies. Uh, airplane crew uh, are the workers that are more exposed to radiation in the world, more than the people working in nuclear reactors. Uh, that, that is not, I mean, the passengers are not aware of that, of course, otherwise we would reduce flying. Uh, but mind that a, a single flight from Venice to, to Los Angeles equals to four full scan X-rays uh, in your body. Um, and actually radiation happened to, uh, to do some errors in, in, in airplanes. That is an accident of the Qantas flight that was flying from Singapore to, um, to from uh, Sydney to Singapore. At a given time, the automatic system was thinking that it was flying 1,024 meters above and so it went down very quickly, and those are the holes produced by the head of the passengers uh, that were not wearing a seatbelt, and, and that, that big damage there was the crew serving dinner. Uh, so uh, when you fly, you always wear a seatbelt, even if uh, the sign is off. Um, I mean, we are laughing of that because it happened where the, when the, fly, the, the, the airplane was high. Imagine if that happened when it was landing. Um, not only, uh, radiation can influence politics. Uh, so in 2003, Maria Vindevogel, gained 4,096 extra votes uh, because of radiation strike. Um, I, I wish uh, I could blame radiation for the elections, but uh, that is, in, in Italy at least is on paper, so we actually can do that. Um, anyway, that, 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 that was, the, I, mean, I know that this story because my mother is Belgian and that happened in Brussels, so, uh, but it was very funny. Uh, it can also influence uh, games. In YouTube you can find this tournament of Super Mario in, in which at a given point, uh, one of the player won the tournament because it, it is Super Mario did a huge jump, which was clearly impossible. And then they track back what happened and radiation was, was the cause of that. And it's very really nice to see the reaction of the other uh, players. And radiation is a personal concern. So this is the, an extract of my car insurance uh, in Italian. But as you can read, the, the insurance does not cover blah, 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 and exposure to ionizing radiation. Um, Clearly, I changed the, 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 the insurance after I read that. And if you think that radiation can hardly impact uh, uh, automotive application, well, in 2007, there was a huge scandal of Toyota that basically because of radiation, the cruise control start to automatically, uh, continuously accelerate the car, okay? And, and you couldn't brake because Toyota was so smart to put the priority on the accelerator, not on the brake. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, a computer scientist would clearly 
turn off the current on it on again, and that would have solved the problem. But most of the people are not computer scientists and unfortunately died because of that. And it's funny to, to read the, the transcript uh, uh, of the trial in which basically Toyota said, well, but it was not us, it was neutrons that, that caused the, the problem. And the judge asked, well, okay, so you are saying that I should blame God for the accident. Uh, and that was very, very funny. Now, uh, that is the problem. How uh, can we deal with that? So as I mentioned, radiation reliability in general is very easily uh, to be solved. You just replicate things like you do in airplanes or you're doing satellites. You triplicate three times everything and you're done. There's a tiny problem of cost uh, into that. Uh, or you can put checkpoint restart. Okay, so every now and then you save the whole system, the whole state of your system. And if you have something wrong, you just go back. Uh, or you can add checksums in, in, your, in your application. What is the problem with that? Is that it is very costly, uh, or either in time, uh, in performances, or, 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 in, um, or in money. So I, w I, I thought, well, is there a better way to do that? Uh, so I mean, this is HPC, so let's try to do what we can to improve performances. So the first thing that occurred to my mind is that when you actually write your code, the way you write the code modifies the way the hardware is used. And even the way that you compile your code modifies the resources of the hardware that are actually used for your application and the way the error propagates. So can we find a good trade-off that we can improve performances and, and also reliability? We tried with, with compiler optimization. So we take uh, matrix multiply on, on GPU. I, I can give you the name there because everything is, is um, normalized. So this is not, it's just relative data. Um, this is in blue, SDCs, so arrows in the output. In, in yellow, you have crashes. Uh, for matrix multiplication uh, executed during radiation experiments with O0, O1 of O3, of, of uh, and uh, mean RF. As you can see, the error rate increases uh, while we, uh, we, we, incre we, we put uh, more optimized flags. Will that mean that I need to uh, combine my code with O0 so lose performances? Not, not really. Because what happens is that uh, if we have O0, we have a long time between two different failures because the error rate is lower. But in that time, we are very lazy. So we do very few things and very slowly. Now, if we put a more optimized uh, flag, it is true that we are increasing the error rate. So we are reducing the time we have between two different failures. But in that time, we are very active. So we are faster. So the idea is that we can actually improve performances more than the increase in the error rate. And this is what happens when you use uh, compile optimization. So it is true that we increase the error rate, but we increase performances faster than the error rate. So in the end, the number of executions that are completely, um, that correctly executed between two different failures is increased. So the message is go as fast as you can. And that also applies to the way you program your, your algorithm. So you run matrix multiplication, you can go in the naive way uh, with, with the different loops, you can use the optimized gem or you can use tensor core. Okay. As you improve uh, the, the, the algorithm, you are going to increase the rate because you use more hardware, but you are improving also performances. So who is gaining there? Uh, where is the trade-off? Uh, this is the comparison of FFT, matrix multiply, uh, Neilman wash and uh, sorting um, running in the naive implementation in red and in the optimized implementation in green. And for each code, I'm showing the fit rate, so the error rate, uh, the execution time, and the number of execution correctly completed between two different failures. So first of all, the, the error rate is increased because we are using more hardware, uh, but in a better way. And in fact, the execution time drops. For matrix multiplication, it is really reduced if you, if you use the optimized version. So at the end of the day, you are producing more correct data between two failures, even if the two failures are closer together. Uh, for matrix multiply, that is five times. Okay, so that basically means that optimizing your code, you can get five times more resilient algorithm. Uh, last optimization is a degree of parallelism. 
So when you write a code for your GPU or for your parallel device, you can decide whether to instantiate a few threads and each thread do a lot of things or to increase the number of threads reducing the workload of each. So as you increase the number of threads, you are increasing the error rate because it's larger the area that is being used for computation. So if you use few threads and you have an error in, in a computing core that is not used, that, that is not affecting your output, okay? If you increase the number of threads, you increase the area, so you increase uh, the, the error rate, but that also means that you are improving performances. So again, who's winning? So as we increase the degree of parallelism, uh, if you go to the right, the error rate is increased of two times. So we are using more area, you have more errors, but the execution time is significantly reduced. So at the end of the day, you are producing more, uh, twice as more data correct than with the naive implementation. So again, the message here is, you can write the code in different ways. You can uh, choose your degree of parallelism or you can choose the uh, compiler optimization. Uh, in the general case, the faster you go, the better, because if you really use the hardware, the way it is meant to be used, you are improving performances more than the increase in the error rate. Now, um, I'm not going through the object detection uh, examples be because I'm running late. I will just mention that um, if you know your application and you know what is a wrong error or what is a critical error for your application, you can design uh, an admin solution that is very efficient. We do that for uh, object detection. I mean, I'm not going through these slides because it, 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 uh, I'm almost done, but, but you will have the slides so you can take a look at them. I will just compare uh, the hardware vendor's idea with ours. So that is the board of NVIDIA and the board of Tesla uh, for autonomous vehicles. How are they dealing with reliability in the most safe way possible? So they are duplicating everything, which again is a good solution, but each of those devices cost $10,000. So are you willing to pay $10,000 more your car just to make it reliable? I mean, no customer will like that. I mean, when I buy a car, it should be intrinsic that the car will not kill me. Um, we, we try to be better than them. And if you take a look at the NVIDIA architecture, you see that you have a lot of redundancy inside the GPU itself. And when you run an application in 64 uh, bit precision, all the other cores in 32, 16, Tensor Core and Integer are unused. And we thought, well, why not use those cores for duplication? Rather than, change, than take another GPU, let's use the redundant hardware inside the same GPU. So basically what we do is we trigger the execution in full precision. In the meanwhile, we cast down the operations. We run it in parallel in lower precision and then compare the results. Uh, at the end of the day, we were able to, to detect 72% of the errors with an overhead as low as, um, uh, as low as 19%. Not showing all the rest of the smart solution that we make, I will go directly uh, to the conclusions. So takeaway messages. So first of all, I hope that I convinced you that reliability is quite, quite an issue uh, and you can't avoid that. Uh, reliability is not against performance, it is part of performance. Uh, either you, you are reliable or you, are, you can't use your, your output. The software is quite complex and the hardware is parallel, so we need to take that into consideration. Uh, and a lot of new technologies are coming out for which reliability is a very, very important issue. Uh, quantum computing, for instance. Uh, remember that Titan has an error every 10 hours uh, and Titan has 18,000 GPUs. Uh, a 25 qubit had an error every 10 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds versus 10 per day. So uh, it's, it's quite, uh, quite an issue. I will not go through this part. I will just go to the acknowledgement. So these are all the people that I want to acknowledge. Uh, my colleagues and students in, in Trento, my friends in Los Alamos, so Chip IR, NVIDIA, Polytechnic Torino in Brazil, at the ARM uh, as in France. Uh, with that, I conclude the talk. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And if you want the slides, you can uh, download them uh, in, in the QR code. Thank you. Yeah.
just of, out of curiosity, how um, quantum computing is affected uh, by those radiation? Is it at the same rate, at lower rate? Uh, compared Much to higher numbers? rate. Okay. I, I'd say at least three orders of magnitude higher. So the real problem is that since the state of the qubit is continuous, is not uh, binary, uh, if you have a binary state, to switch from one state to the other, you need a given amount of energy. If the energy is lower than the threshold, you are not seeing the error. In a quantum chip, uh, every tiny modification of a tiny energy deposition will trigger the error. So th that is the real problem. And the real problem actually is how people are, do are dealing with that, which is burying uh, the system. A and I'm not kidding. So they are really putting the system uh, in, in caves. Okay. That again is a tip. Radiation reliability is very easy to be solved, but that is not very efficient. I was wondering uh, um, how much scalable are the experiments that you were sharing at the beginning to the HPC world? I mean, a lot, of, luckily. Okay. Now so what we are doing is accelerating the number of neutrons. Okay, if you have a large system, you are accelerating the errors because you have a huge amount of devices. So rather than having tens of thousands of devices, we have few devices, but we increase the number of neutrons. What we guarantee is that during the experiment, even if the flux is very high, we do not inject two errors in one execution because that would be not realistic. Okay, so we tune the flux of neutrons uh, in, in a way that we guarantee that one error in one execution at most. So that is scalable because everything is stochastic and not cumulative. So you, you can build the probability and you're done. Our HPCA paper, 2015, we compared the beam experiments on uh, the, the device A with, with the Titan computer and we got a very good match. Actually, that's a funny story. So how I started this work, and I can show you also the image of this. So the first paper I wrote about GPU's reliability, I submitted it to Transaction Nuclear Science. Heather in the picture uh, is the editor of the journal. I submit the paper with the experimental result that we got on our neutron experiment. Heather's husband is uh, in Los Alamos, is responsible of the reliability of their supercomputers. And at dinner, Heather gave to her husband our paper saying, look at these stupid Brazilians. They are saying that the GPU has an error rate of 10 to the 4, which basically means that in your system you will have 14 errors per day. And the husband said, well, we have 15 errors per day, so call him. Uh, and actually we started the collaboration uh, with Los Alamos and we spent a couple of uh, years there. So uh, the match was pretty, pretty good. Okay. I have another question, if I can. Um, I mean, how fair is the trade-off between the uh, between the performance and the uh, reliability that you were showing at the at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation? Because to me, I mean, it would be nicer to see better results in with less frequency than. Uh, um, I mean, it's just my opinion. I don't know. If uh, and I would like a Lamborghini. <laughs> and yeah, for sure, for sure. So, uh, no, no. Seriously speaking, if you, for instance, if you reduce precision and that is fine for your application, that is a very, very efficient way to reduce that rate because less precision means less area, so less hours, and you improve performances. So reduced precision is a very good way in accelerating your application and reducing the error rate. Mind, of course, that an error in 16-bit has a higher impact on your output than an error in 64-bit. So uh, that's another trade-off there, which is the criticality of the failure. But I mean, mixed precision is one good way to deal with that. Uh, a question about uh, parallelism uh, in the, the experiments you did for the reliability. Uh, can you go to the slide uh, related to it? Which, yeah. which slide? Uh, the one uh, with the results of uh, uh, the error rate with the parallelism. Ah, okay, the degree of parallelism. Yes. Okay. There you are. Yeah. This. Uh, yeah, this one. Which kind of parallelism was tested? Uh, like so we tested all kind of parallelism. So we keep the block size fixed and increase the number of blocks, or we keep fixed number of threads dividing more blocks. So we, in, in the paper, you have at least four different degree of parallelism. 
uh, here, I'm obviously, I just showed the better results that we got. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, we, we tested different ways. The, the different uh, um, effect in the, in, the, in the reliability is more related on how the memory is distributed in the GPU. So I if you increase too much the number of threads per block, you, you are saturating the memory, so that creates some problems. Again, this is the best solution we got. Okay. Uh, OpenMP or just? CUDA. CUDA. Ah, CUDA. Okay. CUDA. That was CUDA. Perfect. Maybe, maybe I've lost it, but what, wha what can we do for things on the ISS, for example? Mm -hmm. What can... So in, in the ISS, actually, you are better than here because you are outside of the atmosphere, so you don't have neutrons, and you are inside the vanilla bed, so you don't have protons. So actually, it's a safer place than, than, than here. Um, that, that is why the ISS is there. Okay. As, as, as soon as you go outside of the vanilla belts, then you have two problems. The first problem is that a charged particles, besides the that we see, also can destroy your device. So you, if the particle is, is too energetic, it creates a short circuit in your chip and that, that is gone. Um, I have collaborated, uh, I mean, it, I like that your question brings me to the slides that I haven't shown you. So I have collaborated with JPL on putting a GPU, and we can say it was a GPU now, uh, on, I'm reaching that point, there, uh, in the Ingenuity helicopter, you know that Ingenuity is the only autonomous vehicles in Mars because you can't really control real time a system in Mars for, with a 10 minutes of delay. So my, my work in JPL was to ensure that whatever happens, even if you have a particle strike in the helicopter, that helicopter would never hit uh, Perseverance. That was the only, cons that the only constraints that they gave us. Uh, after one year of work and a lot of money spent, very well spent money, the solution that the, the head of JPL selected was, well, look, let's just fly ingenuity when it is at least a kilometer far from Perseverance. And since ingenuity has a three minutes of autonomy, it will never hit the system. And that was the solution. Uh, that, that picture, I mean, I took the picture after two years that I was in JPL because they invited me with an excuse for then showing me that they were mounting the helicopter, meaning that actually the project wa was approved uh, and that it, it, it's flown. But for space application, uh, the, the situation is very, very bad. So, uh, but in the, in the ISS is better than here. So if you want to put your supercomputer in the IS ISS, that is a good, uh, it, it's a good solution. I would like to know what is the state of the art uh, about uh, shielding? from this kind of yeah. error? Very easy. That is the state of the art of shielding. So <laughs> if you put your system under <laughs> meters and meters of, of concrete, so to stop neutrons, you will need three meters of concrete or two meters of lead. Okay, so that, that, that is a quite effective for atmospheric neutrons. The problem is that the, everything is radioactive and, and you need to actually access the, 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 the system. So the the, the, the yeah, exactly. That, that's a, or, or to fly an airplane. Um, so, th 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 so shielding for neutrons is not really an option, uh, unfortunately. And the cooling system, actually, now that is water cooled, that is very, very bad because when a neutron hits water, uh, water is like a moderator. So it 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 has one neutron that arrives and many neutrons that goes out. So it, we we have checked in in Los Alamos the arrows of the rack of their supercomputers. And the devices closer to the water pipes were the ones that had many, many more arrows than the others. So water cooling is another good way of killing your supercomputer. Yeah. Uh, this is more of an hardware question. Um, on, in terms of die area, uh, most of the space is taken by cache compared to, let's say, air, air use. So I was wondering how this affects uh, it does something like ECC exist for processor cache? No, no, for sure. I mean, in, in a supercomputer, you must have ECC. Otherwise, as you've seen, you don't even boot the system. Okay. In in the processor cache? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all Intel and AMD processor has the ECC turned on by default. I you see. can switch it off looking at the registers, uh, but, but it has ECC in the cache. All the caches, all registers, and the DDR. 
Okay, perfect. perfect. So the, the, the real problem is that when you have a double bit in the memory, the ECC kills the application. So it triggers an exception and the operating system kills the application, which is not very nice. So the redundancy is not enough to correct. No, because the ECC that, that I mean, if you want this to be efficient, you can correct one bit and detect two bit. So I when see. you detect two bit errors, what do you do? You yeah. crash the application. Uh, I mean, you can build an ECC that can correct two, three, or four errors. The point is that the cost would be very, very high. So every time you read mm. an operation, you, you read the data, or you, you fetch the cache, you need to check the ECC, and that takes a lot of time. So you don't really like that. Thank you. So uh, if the goal is to have the longest living st data storage, mm. what, would what would be the best solution? Well, Should we go to well, thanks punch for cards? So or? we have just submitted a paper with Microsoft uh, on using DNA for data storage, with, because the project is to put all the human knowledge in the moon, and it should last for 10,000 years uh, with DNA. And we tested it with neutrons, and it lasts much longer than 10,000 years. So DNA is a quite good way. Now, putting that in your laptop, that, that, is, that, that is hard. But those new technology are, are very, very nice. I mean, my, my, my contribution to the project was simply take the ship, put it in the beam, take it out, and ship it to Microsoft. That was my contribution, but that guaranteed the name on the paper. So I'm happy. Uh, I've got a question regarding the experiments with the accelerator. Uh, mm. uh, yes. Uh, First is a curiosity, did you decap the chip? So we de decap the chip means that you need to remove the package yeah. and thin the silicon to allow the particle to hit that. So with heavy ions for application, yes. You need to have at most 90 micron of silicon on top. Uh, with neutrons, they pass three meters of wall, so you don't really need to decap them. Okay. But with uh, heavy ions, you need, and that's a problem for high-hand GPUs because you need to cool them down uh, and uh, when I was in, in Finland uh, in, in May, the, the, the guys before us were testing high-hand devices, and they put a very nice water cooling system, but <laughs> that was very funny. But they didn't uh, connect it properly, so when they turned it on, there was water in all the accelerator. It was very funny, to s because I was not part of that team, obviously, <laughs> but that, that, that happened. So you need to find smart ways to cool down the system if you decap the, the, the chip. And yeah, did you experience any multiple bit of uh, upsets in yes. the uh, experiments? With so uh, in the newest technology, so seven nanometers and down, I'd say that 30, 35% of the memory errors are double bit errors. 35%, I'd say it's a good, uh, it's, it's a good estimation. Um, uh, did you try even uh, with other uh, uh, chips like not made uh, by silicon, but with other semiconductors. Uh. So the, the the problem there is the problem is solvable. Just get rid of silicon, okay? Because silicon, the problem of radiation is because you have a semiconductor that that when you have the positive charge become a conductive element. Yes, there are other solution. The problem is that it is. Let's face the fact that the market of supercomputers is not big enough to drive technology. We need to accept the technology that is in the market. And the market share is for consumer electronics, so we want faster, cheaper, uh, and, and less uh, power consumption devices. So we go with silicon. And also changing completely the technology for a fab is impossible, basically. Uh, so, so I think we will stay with silicon for, for quite a while. Luckily for me, at least as, as long as I don't retire, I like silicon to be there because otherwise I will be doublet. But, but yes, uh, getting rid of silicon is a good way of solving the problem. But fortunately enough, that is not an option. So. Okay, we are late, but no other questions? Okay, one last one. What is the most neutron interaction with the neutron? So, obviously, a neutron is, it, it not as a charge, right? So, when it hits the, 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 the silicon, it does not by itself uh, generate charge, but it hits the silicon lattice, okay? 
So it either either uh, deposits its energy on the silicon atom, and the silicon atoms emit charge, or it ionizes the silicon atom. So it hits the silicon atom, and it does what neutrons are very effective in doing, so splitting the atoms. So the silicon, the, the neutron arrives, split the atom of silicon, and generate charged particles like alpha particles uh, or two ions, and those ions generate the arrows. So it, 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 it's a sort of is indirect ionization is, is called. But, but that's the real problem of neutrons, that they really can hit the, 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 the device uh, in the core of the device, and they're splitting the atom in the junction and then generating the, the problem. But it's not the, the, the neutron by itself, it, it's the production of the neutron impact that generates the fault.